I'm Megan. I'm Colin. And this is Pet Sitter Sitter Confessional. Confessional. An open and honest discussion about life as a pet sitter. Brought to you by Time to Pet and Pet Perennials. Pivot and adapt. Adapt and overcome. These are the truisms of what it takes to run a business and run a modern dog walking and pet sitting business these days. How do we stay limber? How do we stay active and engaged in the society and the culture and the needs of our clients? And how do we stay flexible personally to be open to making those kind of changes? Today, we are really excited to have Miguel Rodriguez, owner of City Dog Pack, back on the show. He was previously on episodes 38 and 65, a lifetime ago, (laughs) the way the world works these days. Miguel joins us to talk about how he has continued to adapt and learn from the lessons of COVID and lockdowns and clients' expectations. He also shares how he uses social media and his online presence to share much more than just dog tips. Let's get started. Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on again. It's always a good time chatting with you. Uh, but uh, My name is Miguel. I own a company called City Dog Pack. We do dog training, dog boarding, and dog walking in New York City. Uh, I also do a virtual dog training session via Zoom. And uh, I've been running City Dog Pack since April 2010. It'll be 12 years this April. And um, just, you know, working with dogs every day. I'm just dog a dog nerd. I love to talk <laughs> dogs. <laughs> yeah, and I definitely want to get into those classes that you've been running because I, I've been seeing a lot of good stuff and a lot of ac- action around those. But I want to kind of get us caught up a little bit because when we last had you on, it was the middle of the pandemic. Things were raging and kind of chaos was in, <laughs> was all around us. So how how has it been since then? Oh, man, it's it's been crazy. This has been the craziest two years of my life, um, really. Um, but adapting, pivoting, that's that's a word that a lot of small business owners have been hearing a lot last couple of years, pivoting. And uh, I'm happy where I am right now. I made some changes um, since the pandemic first started. And uh, things are going well. I'm, I think I'm finally coming into my own and uh, running things the way exactly. I want I want them to be running. It's working out well. Very mm. grateful. Yeah. Well, that word pivot and adapting, you know, that's something that uh, I feel like you you kind of tackle really well, or at least you you seem to to take on those pretty naturally. Where does that come from for you? How, how does that a process of viewing the need to pivot? Um, how, how do you process that? Yeah. Um, so. Two things. One, I think my time in the Marines definitely helps with that. In the Marine Corps, there's a big saying, uh, adapt and overcome. So mm-hmm. whenever things come up and you know you do have to pivot and, and, and change strategy, you don't complain. You just put your head down, you work, and you just get through it. Um, also, I guess besides reading on books on dog training and dog behavior, um, another thing I'm passionate about is psychology and I read a lot of psychology books and I've learned not to be attached to things. Um, don't be attached to the way things are, people, um, material things, and just be ready to let things go. Um, and when you're willing to let things go, you're able to adapt much better. So um, hmm. I noticed when the whole pandemic first kicked off and a lot of businesses were shutting down and there were a lot of uh, stay at home mandates vaccine mandates, a lot of business owners, they, instead of adapting, they wanted to hold on to the way things were before. And those were the small business owners that I noticed had the hardest time adapting to the changes. And I'm just the type of person, you know, when when change has to occur, you just got to let go and allow things to run its course and just do your best and, and things work out well. When I, when I hear that, about the need to let things go. And and I will pick your brain on on some some books to recommend here in a minute. But the need to let things go as a business owner, it's really hard for us because this is our baby. Right? We built this from the ground up. We've designed it. We have policies in place to meet our needs. We've set our boundaries. We're running and operating the way we want to. And it is really difficult to let this thing that we've created and fostered and protected go and try new things. And so to hear that in if we aren't if we aren't letting things go, there's no room for us to to grow and do new things. 
it's absolutely true definitely um yeah let, let go that's something i often tell myself in, that, in my head a lot of times when i do kind of find myself gripping onto something whether it's you know a change in my business a customer i'm losing um personal relationships pretty much everything well the clients are are hard too i, I think very just for megan and i personally we've we've lost two pretty long-term clients recently. They just had changes in their schedule and changes in their needs and they didn't need us anymore. And my first initial instinct was to take it like super personally and to get offended and to start questioning and kind of start throwing a a little hissy fit, uh, just being (laughs) being honest. Mm -hmm. But, But then having to take a step back and go, like kind of set this up and go, they could have left at any time. It was never going mm-hmm. to be permanent. It was always a chance that they'd leave. It's just right now that it is happening. And having to accept that and then that next step of moving on and moving away from those feelings. So for, for you, when you make that transition of accepting to moving on, how, how do you motivate yourself to move on and away from that? I, I've always found that in life, especially with my business, Whenever something occurred that required me to make a major change that caused me to have some anxiety or sadness, if I just allowed it to occur, the change to occur and make adjustments, things always end up better on the other side. As long as I am willing to let go and and make changes. Um, So now, whenever it does occur, I always kind of tell myself, um, you know, this is probably the universe trying to tell me something that, (laughs) you know, I I need to make these changes and just trust the process. Um, So that's why I tell myself and it really does always work out better. I mean, even with the whole pandemic thing and when the pandemic first kicked off the first 48 hours that they started the, um, you know, the stay at home mandates here in New York city, I lost 90% of my business and it, it was very scary. I just bought a house just had a, a baby about a year or two prior. Mm. And um, I, I just didn't know what I was going to do. And, you know, now today I'm better off than I was in, in my business uh, since 2019 before the pandemic. Wow. Yeah. Trusting the process. And sometimes that, that takes, at least for me going, okay, I have to remember that it turned out okay in the past. Right, I have to kind of remind myself, okay, the last time I went through this struggle, X, Y, Z happened and I was really worried and then I got put in this better position. And reminding ourselves that we overcame in the past, that things turned out differently and a lot, as you said, like better than we ever expected to if we just let that process and be, and, and be open to, to accepting the opportunities as they come along. So you mentioned that you had made some changes in your business and it's operating a lot better now, you know, it's, it's, we've had, we had some changes and what about your business? Did you find out either wasn't working for you or what new changes did you put in place since the pandemic? Yes. So the major change that I've made was uh, not managing such a large staff that I was prior to the pandemic. Um, Prior to the pandemic, when it came to the, the dog walking portion of my business, I had a, a large, you know, a staff that was growing. Uh, I had probably about eight dog walkers working for me, and that wasn't enough. You know, every day prior to the pandemic, it was just like I was treading water trying to figure out how I was going to get through the day with the staff members that I had, with all the dogs that we had to the service. So it was very anxiety-inducing. And when it comes to managing staff, staff members are very expensive, and for the most part, they're not very reliable. I would say two out of every ten staff members are like all-star staff members and the other eight are just there. And then like two out of those eight are just no good. Um, A great book to to read about managing staff members is from uh, Dan S. Kennedy. He he wrote a a series of business books. I realized I don't, I don't really like managing staff and it's not that I don't like people. It's just whenever you're running a business, there's so many things that require your attention uh, and when you're diverting some of that attention to to babysit staff members, it, it just doesn't allow you to do your job to the best of your ability. So what I did was I just consolidated my staff members. I just have two people working for me now. And um, I cut back on the number of, of dogs that I take in that we service every day. 
I'm focusing more on dog training and creating content. Um, and what I found is that I service fewer customers. I have to manage less staff members, but as far as like the, the revenue, it's about the same or even more than before. And I'm also enjoying what I'm doing more. Um, I, I've learned when it comes to business, there's so many things that you, you, know, you have to think about the actual uh, service that you provide or you know, the good that you provide for your customers. You have to think about all the administrative stuff. You have to think about marketing. And what I've learned is that if you don't, you're not going to like every part of the business. You're not going to like to do every part of it. So whatever you don't like to do, you delegate and just double down on the things you enjoy doing. Because if you don't enjoy doing it, no matter how disciplined you are, you're not going to be very good at it. For example, the bookkeeping, which I absolutely despise. <laughs> every every Saturday, I would spend a couple of hours, you know, maintaining the books, and it's just I was miserable. And then I found somebody else that could do it for me and enjoys it, and I can see how she she enjoys putting these numbers together. I asked her, "Why do you like doing this?" But she's so efficient at it because she enjoys doing it. So I I'd rather pay her to do that. And also, when it comes to dele delegating, you got to think about how much is how much is your time worth per hour. Mm. So if you know, let's say. Your, your your work is worth you know $150 per hour. Why are you going to be spending time doing work that's like $20 an hour when you can just pay someone else to do that? They'll do it better than you do, and you can just you know make more money doing what you do well. So that's what mainly the changes that I made. Um, I'm focusing more on, on dog training, uh, maintaining uh, uh, less staff members, and maintaining less customers daily. And it, mm. it's been great. It's a, far less stressful than before. With that process for you, as you were deciding, so it sounds like you, you know you scaled back the the amount of staff you had, so you had to get rid of get rid of clients. What was that like for you as you were kind of downsizing and shifting the business? Was it you know telling and communicating to clients that you're not going to be servicing them anymore? Um, walk us through how you navigated those waters. So that was pretty easy because, like I said, when the, the pandemic first kicked off, I lost about 90% of my customer base. Mm. Um, and, and the thing about that, you know, there's – um, what's that show? That, you ever watch the show Shark Tank? Yeah. Kevin O'Leary, the bald head guy, the, the, <laughs> like the main shark. Yeah. I watch a lot of his, his stuff on YouTube, and he, he mentioned in business you have to be ruthless because mm. – if you're not ruthless in business, ruthless, a business would be ruthless with you. And prior to the pandemic, I, I had many customers that I would walk their dog every day. And, um, you know, I would try to grow and expand. And, and when you grow and expand, especially in dog walking business, you can't keep walking the same dogs you've been walking since day one. Eventually, you have to delegate other dog walkers to walk them. And so many of my customers didn't want anybody else to touch their dog but me. Mm. And what would happen is I would stick with walking a dog every day. And because I would have to, you know, I was dedicating myself to that dog every day. It would miss, I would miss out on growth for the business. Um, and those same people are saying, you know, I want you Miguel, because, you know, I have a personal relationship with you. You know, you come in here every day. My family sees you. They're used to you. My dog loves you. And, you know, I, I took that to heart and, you know, um, and, and I, and I dedicated myself to them and their dogs and, and, and it has set me back but i was okay with it because the relationship was more important to me though a lot of those same customers the moment that they learned that they didn't have to go into the office every day and they could work out of home they dropped me like quickly and a lot of them didn't even you know ask me how i'm doing they just said and some of them didn't even you know formally cancel the service some of them just stopped booking walks and boarding um, so that, that was a learning experience. Like, oh, okay, that's business. And, and, and like you said, um, you know, you felt when you lost certain customers, you kind of felt bad and you kind of upset about it. You took it personally. I did at first too, but then I learned, you no, know, that's just business. And these same people that you were sacrificing over were willing to, to drop you. So if you have a, an opportunity to grow your business, you owe it to yourself. You owe it to your business. You owe it to your family members. You owe it to your customers, you owe it to your community that you serve to do what's best for your business. Not in a sense that, you know, you're going to compromise the service that you provide for other people, but 
the, the better your business is, the more resources your, your business your business has, the better you can serve your customers. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I did was uh, a lot of those customers that left, a lot of them came back when they had to go back to the office or when they, they, you know, they came back from Florida. A lot of people fled to Florida and came back. And they try to get back in, in my in my um, in my rotation. I just told them I'm not available now. You know, you left, and a lot of other people left too. So I had to make some changes, and I'm not focusing so much on doing walks every day. And um, some of them were upset about it, and but most of them kind of understood because deep down inside, they kind of didn't know that they just kind of like dipped out on me without even telling me anything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is, I mean, that's a, that's a lesson and a half, right? Like it, because we pour, this is a service industry. We, we, we pour ourselves in this so much that we forget we're running a business and this manifests itself mm-hmm. in so many different aspects, whether it's our pricing, our policies, our boundaries, but we yeah. tend yeah. to forget the emotional side of becoming um, like, it's not bad to be emotionally invested with clients and with with the the dogs that we're walking, but it is bad when it starts clouding our ability to make sound business judgments. And just like you said, when those clients, you know, they left us, it was okay. This is business. They recognize it. They they weren't offended. They didn't. You know, there was no name calling. There was no bad reviews. They just said, okay, this business venture is done, and we need to move on. And it it kind of helped us snap back to reality and go, yes, this is a business. People do this all the time to, uh, you know, their 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 hairstylist, to the people that you know for the uh, the car repairs, to the plumbers, to the, mm-hmm. they they just need a service sometimes, and that's hard a lot of time for for us to accept. Uh, but at the end of the day, like that's, that's, that is that. And if we, and if we don't view that, just like you said, we stop being able to make those ruthless decisions that we have to make in business sometimes. And it's, it's, it's difficult to make those decisions, but the more practice and the more you actually apply it, the easier it becomes. And, you know, you mentioned there is that emotional aspect, no doubt. I mean, when you're taking care of a dog very often, whether you're boarding the dog, training the dog, or, or walking the dog, you're going to get an attachment with the dog. And and I do. I, I love these dogs that, that I take care of. Like, really, I, I think about them all the time. When they're not feeling well, they're injured. And even if they're not under my care at that particular moment, I think about them. And also the, the, the families. I mean, a lot of these families, you know, I've been doing this for 12 years. I, I've watched them grow. Like, for example, I'll have a, cu- a young couple who, uh, you know, got a new puppy and wants me to walk their dog every day. And I come to their apartment every day. I see them. I say hi to them. And then I'm there when they have children, when they get married. And then, you know, I, mm. I, I watch their children grow up. That emotional aspect is going to be there. And I, I'm okay with that. But when it comes time to making a business decision, a business change, you have to do that and, and, and communicate with these customers. Explain to look. You know, I care about you. You know, we're still, if you ever need me for anything, you have my phone number. You can always give me a call. If you ever want to talk to me about anything, just give me, I'm still available to you. I'm just not going to be there every single day to walk your dog because I'm not just a dog walker. I'm not just a dog trainer and I'm not just a pet sitter. I'm a business owner. Um, So, you know, my, my attention is required in other areas. And for me to keep servicing you and your dog and your family, you have to allow me to do these things. You have to trust me to provide you with another person that's going to provide the service. And it might be half. They, they, they're a representative of me. You have to trust that. Well, and as you said, in order to continue to provide a good quality service and do the best you can, you have to put the business first. Because if the business doesn't – and the reason is, is because if your business doesn't exist – you're not doing any service to anybody, right? And and so that's where this 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 understanding of what's my purpose and how do I get there and how do I continue to doing this? And that sometimes means letting clients go or changing your services or raising prices, which is a big t- topic of discussion these days. And knowing that this will all help me, these decisions are all helping me run a better business so that I can actually continue to provide service because that's we, we want. That's what we want to be doing is providing the services that we are. It's just we have to make good, sound decisions to get us there. Have you heard of Time to Pet? 
Claire from Acton Critter Sitters has this to say. Time to Pet has honestly revolutionized how we do business. My sitters can work much more independently because they have ongoing access to customer and pet information without relying on me. I save hours upon hours of administrative time on billing, processing payments, and generating paychecks. If you are looking for new pet sitting software, give Time to Pet a try. Listeners of our show can save 50% off your first three months by visiting timetopet.com slash confessional. And, and, and a, a quick tip about pricing, because I know pricing is a, is a big, <laughs> it's a hot button topic when it comes to the pet sitting and the pet care industry, because oftentimes us as, as caretakers of animals, it's a very emotional relationship that we have with these dogs. So we feel bad to charge a premium for these services. It's almost like we feel guilty to do that. But what I've learned, because I was charging grossly under you know, on the pricing myself for out of the 12 years, maybe eight years out of the 12 years, I was running city dog pack. And even now my prices are, are underpriced. Hmm. So you have to look at it like this. You have to charge what your services are worth. Of course, when you're first starting off and you're learning, you can't charge a premium because you haven't earned that premium yet. You know, you still have to learn more about the business, about the services you provide. So, you know, sometimes I see these brand new, you know, these brand new pet sitters just come out of nowhere and they're charging, you know, double what I charge, which is crazy. But anyway, so you, you have to charge an appropriate amount for one reason. It, it's going to help you, your business is going to help everybody else. Because if you're not charging the right amount, you're going to have other businesses and your competitors that are going to out market you because they're charging the right amount and they're allocating a certain amount of money for marketing that you can't even afford. So they're going to out market you and they're mm-hmm. just going to, they're going to choke you out. Uh, and another thing is when you're not charging the right amount, you have to make a certain amount of revenue to break even and to make a profit. So if you're not charging the right amount, you're cramming in a lot more customers. And when you cram in so many customers and you're overworking your staff, your service, the quality of your service declines. And also when you have, when you charge a certain amount, you could invest a lot of that money back into your business to improve your service. Um, for example, like if you have, if you do dog walking, you can, you know, put uniforms on your, on your, uh, uh, on, you could have your, your staff members wear uniforms. And when people wear uniforms, they tend to behave differently. Mm-hmm. Um, you can, you can hire a higher caliber of dog walkers and pet sitters to work for you. When you charge the, pro- the appropriate amount. And if you have customers that complain, I find every time I raise cost- I raise prices, um, there's always that 10% of customers that do complain. And the way you manage that is know your numbers. Have everything written down. How much does it cost you to provide the service? What's all your overhead? And how much money do you need to make to break even? And then, so whenever I have a customer that complains, all I do, I have everything ready, written down. Look, this is how much money I make per profit I make per per walk, whether it's another dog walker doing it or I'm doing it myself. And also, I sh- I show them a list of uh, competitors in the neighborhood, in the area that and what they charge, and I compare my price with theirs, and I give them a full breakdown of my prices. And they had when I show them that they have nothing to say, hmm. and then they have the decision: you can you can have me and pay me this amount, or you can go with someone else. <laughs> it's up to you. Well, I love how you touched on, and I think this is so important in the fact that when we charge enough in our business, we can, it it does things, right? Our business can start doing things. And too often we forget that our business is there to do things for, for us, for our community, for our staff, if we have them and for clients, we, and, and that only happens, we are only able to do those things with that money that we have. And if we're chronically undercharging, We aren't able to give gifts to our favorite clients. We aren't able to take extra trainings. We aren't able to do these things for our staff and give raises. And we become kind of impoverished in a lot of different ways. And yet, like you said, we're busy all the time because we cram our schedules full and then we're tired and we're also broke and we don't really see the point of it. And so we, the the company folds and we go under. Instead, again, looking back at, I want my company to be here tomorrow and the next day. I want to be able to service that client year after year after year. And I do that when the nuts and bolts of it is, I I do that by earning enough money. In order for me to show up tomorrow, I have to have the money to do that. And that's a very frank conversation that 
we have to have with ourselves and look at those numbers and understand what we need and how, how the business needs to operate to get that to us. Yeah, definitely. And it's not all about money. The thing is, if you don't charge the appropriate amount, again, you're going to cram. And when, and when you cram, I, I think they, they say, uh, I think 80% or 80% of small businesses die after the first year. I don't think it's because of revenue. Because I've seen a lot of great small businesses, whether it's in the pet industry, the restaurant industry, that provide an outstanding service or product, and they die after about a year or two. I think it's often because they underestimate how hard they're going to have to work. And also, I think they become overwhelmed. Hmm. And once they become overwhelmed, they just figure, you know, this is not worth it. And they just kind of just give up. You should never be at, when it comes to the pet industry, when you're doing dog boarding, walking or training, you should never be at full capacity. You should always be at about 80%. You should always have that 20% buffer. The reason why you want to have the 20% buffer is because, you know, things come up and you want to be available for your clients and you're not overstressed. You're not, you know, running yourself ragged. And uh, it just allows you to be the best version of yourself when you're at hundred percent, just redlining it every day. You it doesn't matter how disciplined and tough you are. You're just going to break down. And I think that's what happens with a lot of uh, small business owners. And that's why I think a lot of dog walking businesses and pet sitting businesses die pretty quickly. I see them come and go every year. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it is an industry that will chew you up and spit you out. It, it, there's no real mercy. There's always more mm-hmm. demand. There's always more need. There's always more walks. There's always more visits. And unless we, the business owners, forcibly impose space in our lives and on our schedule, we won't have anything. Right? I know one one of the reason a lot of people look to pet sitting is they go, oh, a flexible schedule. That what a wonderful <laughs> thing, right? And we, those of us who've been doing this for oh, a while, chuckle, chuckle, and go, well, mm-hmm. it's not not really, but it it is if you make it that way. It is if you give yourself that space. If you're not running at 100% capacity all the time, if you say no to clients on some weekends just because you really need the weekend off and you give yourself that space that comes in and knowing, okay, I, I have to be charging appropriately, but I also have to be giving myself these boundaries and the space so that I can, so, so there's, so there's some of me left at the end of the day mm-hmm. to do things that I actually enjoy. It's, it's so true. And, and it's funny, you know, when it comes, when I'm walking my pack in New York City, I always get people stopping me in the street saying, you have the best job in the world. Or like, you know, people say, that's a great job. And it is a great job, but it's not for everyone. When it comes mm-hmm. to, you know, being a caretaker of dogs, it's, not a, it's a lifestyle because you're always working. You always have dogs to take care of. And if you don't have dogs to take care of, you have to answer emails. You're just constantly working. So it, it if it's not for you, it's just not going to work out. And, you know, people always tend to think that what other people do is so much easier than what they're going to do. <laughs> yeah, that's, that is, that is true. <laughs> they have, they have no idea. And that again gets to the weird aspect of, of what we do. There's, there's this levity, there's the seriousness, there's this all consuming nature of the industry. And it's, it's tough to communicate that to people. Definitely. Absolutely. In addition to uh, pulling back on the amount of staff, you said you moved into doing a lot more training and virtual sessions. So I I really want to hear how that has been going for you. It's been going great. Um, As far as the training, because I was getting so busy with the walks before the pandemic. And I started off City Dog Pack as as a dog trainer primarily. And then people started asking me to, to walk and board their dogs. And then the you know, that, that, that part of the business started to grow so rapidly that I kind of put training on the wayside. Um, but, uh, now I've just been focusing a lot more training and it's just, just what I really love to do the mm-hmm. most. I love walking dogs in the pack. I love doing that, but the training part, you know, the behavior and seeing dogs transform before your eyes and seeing these stressed out, overwhelmed dog owners who are at the brink of giving up their dog you know, turn around, become best friends with their dogs. That's just so rewarding for me. And as far as the, uh, the virtual sessions, it, it's great. Cause I can service people everywhere, not just in New York, but all around the country and even different parts of the world as well. 
you know, I have people from Australia who call me sometimes from uh, customers in, in Asia and South Africa and different parts of Latin America because they find me on Instagram. And it, and it's fun, you know, dealing with these different people with different cultures. And it's very interesting. Um, dog owners from different like continents and different countries are so much different from American dog owners. So it's, it's been very, very interesting. Now, when you made that switch and you, know, you said you always had this interest in training and you were pursuing this and, but it kind of was consumed by the walks and stuff. What did that do mentally when you started to get back into doing a service that you hadn't done in a while and that you were actually finding a lot more joy in? At first, I was a little rusty because um, I never stopped doing dog training. I would just do like, you know, one or two training sessions a week or so. And then after the pandemic, I was doing like, you know, three, four training sessions a, a day, plus doing some virtual sessions and um, uh, dog training webinars on the weekends as well. Um, but it was it, it just made me realize, you know, how much I, I love dog training and dog behavior. And um, not only dog behavior, but, you know, human behavior, because I would say 50% of the, of what I do is almost like human psychology because <laughs> people don't realize like how much, you know, the way they perceive their dog and the way they interact with the dog on a day-to-day basis plays a major role in the dog's behavior. And uh, when I can kind of just point things out to them and, you know, I see that light bulb light up in their head. And that's when the changes come. I think it's so cool. Um, yeah, so I was a little rusty at first, but then I started whipping out the old dog training books from like old schools and courses that I took and started reading old old books that I, that I read back in the 90s. And it all started to come back to me and, and I'm just deep into it now. I'm constantly reading articles and books on, on dog behavior. Well, I think it's important too. Again, thinking as as a business and as, a, as just at the personal level, knowing that if there is something out there that really like feeds your soul as a person and and at the at that level, to make time and space for that, and even try pursuing it at a business level and in doing it more and more, because we we want to make sure that we are avoiding this this drudgery, this uh, monotony, this, these things. I mean, even you, when you were talking about, about delegating and do, to getting things off of your plate, well, part of the getting things off of your plate is then to have more time to do other things. And this is part of going, man, I, it really makes like, and whatever that is, like, it really makes me happy to, uh, you know, do training or to make video content or to make my social media posts or whatever, finding that stuff and res- in, in, in making sure that you, you could keep doing that, I think is, is really important, especially as business owners, where we feel like we just kind of have to do stuff, knowing that we can still cherish and, and find joy in the things that we do. Like I said before, if you don't enjoy doing something, it doesn't matter how disciplined you are and how hard you work, you just you're not going to do a good job. You're going to get burned out. You have to enjoy what you're doing. And right now, what, what I enjoy doing, I, like, again, I love boarding dogs in my house. I get the companionship with them. It's a lot of fun. I love going on pack walks in New York City. It's such an exciting city. You walk around and you know, I have four or five dogs with me and just, you know, it, it's, it's a great time. But teaching, I, I just love to teach. So when I can teach a dog owner, you know, Know, new things that kind of you know changes your dog behavior or especially the webinars i really enjoy the webinars because whenever i'm, I'm teaching a webinar i see all these faces on a on a screen and i bring up a point about a dog training a dog behavior and you know I, I see their faces like oh man that makes sense how can we get that that i i love that and, and the, you know the feedback and the interactions when i do the q a portion that's what i enjoy the most and also when i create content and i and I offer information to anyone who wants to watch on Instagram. It, it, it's so interesting how I'll post a video uh, and then a year later, I'll have someone who sends me a DM that I never even interacted with on Instagram and say, hey, you know, my dog had severe separation anxiety. Like I, I was so close to, you know, sending him to the shelter. And I try some of these things that you mentioned and it just worked and he's doing so much better now. Like, that's what I enjoy doing the most. That's what I have fun with the most. So that's what I, I want to do the most now is uh, creating content and, and teaching, teaching people. 
Yeah. What was that transition like for you doing, you know, doing the in-person training in classes to now doing almost, it sounds like a, a, the majority of them are all virtual and on these, we, with these webinars for, for you, what, what's been, what's been like managing those? Uh, well, there's nothing that can substitute, you know, having me being present there to demonstrate things with people, but it's made me, Offering the online sessions and the webinars has made me a lot better in my personal dog training sessions because sometimes when I'm there physically, I kind of like, I'm a little bit too hands-on and I don't allow the dog owner to kind of like figure things out on their own. And I'm just there doing it and it kind of depend on me too much. Hmm. But when I'm doing a virtual session with say someone in Florida or someone say in the, that lives in the Caribbean or something, I can't be there to do everything for them. So I have to you know, articulate exactly what they should be doing and, and giving them detailed instructions. And they have no choice but to do it themselves. And they end up being a lot more successful at it. Um, so because I learned that whenever I do like my one-on-one -on -one personal training session, I try to be hands-off as possible, not do anything with the dog and just try to explain to them. And I find, find that the results are a lot better because of that. Now, how frustrating is that to you? Because just know me personally, I have tried to give like instructions to my father about how to do something on a computer remotely. And I just want to pull my hair out whenever if I could just do it, you know, it happened 10 times faster. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, when it comes to tech and, and older people, even with me, I'm so like, when it comes to tech, I just don't get it at all. So yeah, and people who try to run me through things. It, it's funny when it comes to tech. Sometimes I'm trying to figure out how to do something and I'll have someone call, you know, I'll call someone that I know that's really good. And they try to run me through it. They tell me, oh, it's easy. Don't worry. I'll explain to you. I'll explain to you how to do it in like 10 minutes. And then when they actually try to explain to me, it's taking a lot more 10 minutes and I can sense the frustration in their tone. <laughs> 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 but but to, I, th I think, you know, so he hearing what you're talking about, Miguel, here, it's like you become a lot more self-aware of how you operate in certain situations. And I think that is that is so important for us because this stuff is just second nature to us. And and we may be in a rush or hurry, so we may just grab and do and go. And instead of letting somebody come in and, and learn it themselves, giving them that opportunity, allowing them to have that experience, I think is really important as us. And and, and I, I view my role as a pet sitter, a dog walker, as as an educator for clients. Like, well, I'm, I'm here to help them live an amazing life with their pet. That means Means teaching yeah. them and allowing them and giving them space in a safe area to learn and expand and ask questions. And if I'm constantly, you know, answering the questions before they can have a time to think about it or just showing them right away or not giving a time for them to kind of take in this information, I, th there's not as much uh, learning going on in that interaction as we may think. Definitely. And you mentioned something that just, uh, this just reminded me of something you mentioned, like the self-awareness. When, when I do these virtual training sessions, I often record them onto Zoom. And sometimes I go back and I review the session. And mm. I realized, man, I, I articulated that horribly. Like, or, you know, why did I say that? I should have said this instead. I was stupid. So, <laughs> so it does make me a lot more self-aware. And it, and, it, and it has helped me improve our like articulating certain things and certain concepts about dog behavior and training. Yeah. Well, oh man, that that self review process is is a. It's really painful, right? Nobody likes to. Oh man, look at it's, you. Gut, it's gut wrenching. <laughs> I, I would imagine you being a podcaster, you probably listen to some things you said or asked like, why did I say that? But that's that's part of the process. That's that part makes of the process. <laughs> Hundreds of hours at this point. It's it's painful, but yeah, yeah it's <laughs> but but it's it's painful, but it's the best way to learn about yourself. And mm -hmm. I, I just looking at us and how we operate, it's, man, it seems like, you know, an example may be, man, it seems like everybody I talk to about my services doesn't quite understand what's going on. And you could say, well, they just don't get my business. But mm -hmm. is it how you're explaining it? Are you giving good examples? Are you using the right language? There's all these things where we can start reflecting on ourselves and go, okay, well, maybe if I tried this slightly different way of, of presenting this information, 
it might get across better. And it's kind of an iterative process, but that makes sure that we are communicating as clearly and precisely as possible so that there's no confusion, whether that's the services or pricing or expectations or training instructions, because that, that's going to help set them up for success. That's so true. And, and when it comes to business, sometimes, you know, you may meet business owners or other pet sitters, or dog walkers who are either not getting customers or, um, you know, if they're a dog trainer, they're not getting the results that they want from, from their clients and, and the dogs that they that they train. And oftentimes you can hear, they, they'll post on social media, like these rants complaining about everybody else or, you know, whenever you, you converse with them, they talk about, they're complaining about why they, their business isn't growing. Mm. And as you talk to them, there's these glaring red flags that are coming up that they're just so unaware of, you know, but if you just kind of like, you know, you mentioned, you know, like um, these customers are not getting what I'm trying to um, explain to them about my services. And you, like you said, you can easily say it's everybody else, but you always have to look within, look within and ask yourself, is this something that I'm doing wrong? And when you have when you have that self awareness, you're just so much better as a business owner and as a pet sitter, as a dog walker, as a dog trainer. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, and it's like I said, it's it's a painful process, but it's really necessary because we want we want our businesses to be operating at the best way possible, and we want ourselves to be as well. So that takes review and getting outside input sometimes. So bringing in trusted friends or family or acquaintances or, or I, some of the best advice is to ask. Uh, to your clients about how am I doing? Did, how is the yeah, onboarding process? Hard, yeah. Right. That's ugh, getting that kind it's of feedback. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some, some of my clients are, are very successful entrepreneurs. Hmm. And um, sometimes they'll drop little hints. They'll drop little comments to me trying to like, you know, tell me you should be doing this, Miguel, or, or you should do this better. And I kind of ignore it. And then when I eventually say, oh, let me face and ask, what do you mean by this? And some of these, when it comes to really successful entrepreneurs, most super successful entrepreneurs, they've been through the ringer. They, they've been through like the failures, the setbacks. So once they finally get to where they are, when they become successful and they see other entrepreneurs making the same mistakes that they made, that they've made in the past, it can be ruthless when they tell you, you know, you need to do this better. And sometimes mm. I, I, I have other people like, you know, successful entrepreneurs hold me accountable and tell me that I should be doing better things. And even now, there's certain things that I should be doing now that I should be focusing on that I'm, that I'm kind of just, you know, procrastinating on. And, but it's a constant, you know, it's, it's a constant learning process. Absolutely. And it's hard, but self-awareness, it's, it's key. I think that a lot of that starts with knowing this person is telling me this information for my own good, right? This is, and, and I, they're, they're wanting to help me, right? And so kind of putting, again, putting away some of these, these, these feelings or these emotions of getting hurt or being offended and going, no, I, I, if I ask for this information, if I ask for feedback, and sometimes we don't ask for it, but we have to go, okay, this person is telling me because they want me to be better. And that kind of, I know at least helps me start putting some things in to action yeah you know i, I once you know, i have a client that i've had i've had him at a, as a customer for like 11 years almost and mm -hmm. he's a super successful entrepreneur he's in tech and he really cares about me but he's very straightforward with me and, and uh <laughs> he had a dog <laughs> he had a dog that, that i walked and trained for many years and the dog got old and passed away and he got a new dog and he tells me hey um uh i need help with you know housebreaking my dog is you know peeing and pooping all over the house and he's doing this so can you come over tomorrow at five o'clock and, and and help me out i'm like sure so i get there at 5 15 i was late and he's like oh you're late and i'm like yeah i'm sorry you know the train he goes yeah but that's that's 15 minutes like he goes you know how much money i make per hour and i'm like no how much and he tells me how much he goes and so you're 15 minutes late and those 15 minutes are worth more than what I'm paying you for this training session. So I shouldn't even pay you for the training session. Oh. And I'm like, whoa, like, shut <laughs> up, dude. And he goes, but I'm, he goes, but I'm going to do it anyway. And he goes, if you, you're having trouble with scheduling, maybe you should, you should have a personal assistant because if you're that busy, you should, you should afford a personal assistant. So having a personal assistant, the, the money that you're paying them is actually going to come back twofold for you. So you might want to look into that very serious before the, the training session started. And he, 
very stone cold just looked at me dead in my eye and told me and i, I could have t- taken it personally but i just took it i'm like you know what you're absolutely right mm. we just went on with the training session after that wow wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But but I, but- I like having people like that around me yeah, and you know, and he told you that because he was like, I, you know, th- this is somebody who I want to be successful and needs, ne- you know, this I just need to tell this information and learn from my experiences and start putting it into practice. Again, the, these people who say these things, yeah, you could immediately sit down and go, "How dare you? You don't know me. Um, I'm doing my best here," but going, "Okay, right, you know, that makes a lot of sense, and um, I can I can make changes." Right? That just knowing that the, yeah, um, yeah. that kind of feedback is, is helpful. Yeah, yeah. And I still haven't got a personal assistant, so. <laughs> yeah, next year, I, you're, 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 there's been some things going on. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Pet Perennials makes it easy as one, two, three to send a heartfelt condolence gift directly to someone with a broken heart. They have this awesome direct-to-client gift service that takes the effort off of us and ensures a thoughtful, personalized sympathy gift reaches our client or our employee. All gift packages include a handwritten card, colorful gift wrap, and shipping fees across the U.S. and Canada. They also offer an array of milestone gifts and greeting cards that can be sent to celebrate birthdays, extend get well wishes, and welcome new and rescued pets. Additionally, there are gift choices in case you need to send a sympathy gift in memory of a special human client or celebrate a pregnancy, engagement, or wedding of a pet lover. If you're interested, register for a free business account to unlock the all-inclusive discounted package prices. The service is leveraged on an as-needed basis, so there are no monthly or annual obligations or minimum purchase prices. Learn more and register by using the link in our show notes and enter the referral code PSC at registration. You'll get a unique coupon code to save $2 off any package prices that you send in your first 90 days. Mega, one of the things that I know how you, or at least watch how you you, you run and operate is um, you're extremely active on Instagram specifically. Um, it, it's a platform that you use uh, to share information and to get in, t- in contact with people. H- how do you know what information you want to put on Instagram versus in a webinar versus on one-on-one sessions? It just comes to me like, you know, because I'm constantly doing training sessions. So if I'm noticing a certain trend in dog behavior that a lot of dog owners are struggling with, for example, when the pandemic first kicked off and you had all these people getting dogs, and they're stuck in, they were stuck in their apartments with their dogs all day, a lot of those dogs end up having separation anxiety. So when I notice a certain trend going on and I say to myself, maybe I should make a video on this. Or mm-hmm. if I recently worked with a, a dog that was a particular case that was interesting, um i'll I'll make a a training session on that i mean i'll I'll make a a dog training video on that so it just pretty much whatever pops up in my head or it's something new that i learned or a new breakthrough that i that i made with a dog then uh, i'll make a video but it's it's random it's not really planned sometimes i don't even plan to record a video and just you know i'm thinking about a training session that, that i have later on that day and i think i'm thinking about certain things i'm gonna you know uh mention to the dog owner and i just make a video Hmm. Well, and you use video very, very well. And I know that that is something that I struggle with and, and many people do. So uh, what's some advice you'd give to somebody who is a little camera shy and doesn't like really going through that video process? Uh, number one, repetition. Um, if you look at my video, if you go to my IGTV videos, you go way back to the videos that I made, like say four or five years ago. They were horrible, so <laughs> awful. I wasn't, you know, I was like stammering with my words, and you know, and stuttering is something I've always struggled with since I was a kid. But um, just uh, one is, is repetition. Keep doing it. The more often you do it, the more confident you're gonna get. Um, two, don't worry so much about how you look and how you sound. Um, if you think about it, like some of the most influential people. For example, Truman Capote, which is one of my my favorite authors, he had a very strange way of talking, had a very high-pitched voice. But when you heard him, you know it's him. Mike Tyson, he talks strange. But when you hear Mike Tyson, you know it's Mike Tyson. (laughs) So even if you have a a weird way of communicating or you sound strange, it's you. 
Mm. And when people hear you, they're going to know it's you. And that's a good thing. That's like branding yourself unintentionally. So don't be so afraid to make uh, mistakes or be so self-conscious. Just just do it and, and do repetition. And, and the more and more you do it, the better. You, and even now, I'm not the best speaker, um, but I'm getting better. And this is just because I'm just putting more videos out there. And I find that the, the, the bigger laps I have between videos, the more anxiety I get to um, post a new video. Mm. So the more you do it, the more often you do it, it's just the easier it gets. I love that advice of going, you know, how you look, how you sound, that's, that's you, right? And, and being okay with that. And I know I'll shoot it with video or whatever and go, oh, I'm doing that weird thing with my mouth or I'm looking weird or look at my hair or look, I can't believe I said that and go, you know, this is, this is part of accepting who we are as, as people and, and knowing that I, I can practice and I can work on this, but I don't get better unless I just start doing it. And to not compare ourselves to, the videos of people who've been doing this for 12 years or 15 years or the people who do this professionally and, and to not get caught up into that and just go, I have to start and I can start in whatever way I can. And a lot of that's speaking from where you are in authority. So your experiences, your story, um, you know, the, the, the things you encounter, like, like you said, Miguel, like, Oh, I, I was talking about this in a training session and I figured oh, this needs to get shared to other people. You know, if I had this conversation with a client today, it was really good. I need to share that with other people and just start putting it out there and know that that's going to be practice, right? It's, it's, we're always practicing. We're always trying to improve and it just takes time. Absolutely. And another piece of advice is be careful with what advice you take when it comes to, you know, making yourself more comfortable on camera, because if you go on YouTube, they'll tell you, you know, when you talk on a camera and make sure you're looking at the camera this way and, you know, you're speaking with this tone of voice and, when you do that, you start being you start to look a lot more unnatural. A lot of people comment on a lot of videos that I post that I'm, I'm looking around very often. <clears throat> and some people say, you know, you should probably look at the camera more often when you need to talk. But that's not the way I talk. talk. And it's kind of strange. It's a weird thing I do. But when I'm talking, especially when I'm in deep thought and I'm trying to think about the best way to articulate something, I don't make my, much eye contact. I kind of make my, my eyes kind of wander a little bit. And that's the way I gather my thoughts. And what's most important is, is what you're saying and the information you're putting out there. That's the number one thing. So focus on, on that. So I don't care if I look around very much. That's just the way I talk. And, it, and it, if, if you say, for example, you have a dog that barks like crazy, you have a dog that's aggressive, that pulls on a leash. And if I'm giving you really good information that can really help your situation, who cares if I'm looking at you or not? You know, so it's just the way I talk. And if you don't like it, then find somebody else to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, because but, you know, when, when we sit there and we go, okay, well, it's, it's about trying to not have as many compounding factors on us. We're trying to lower that barrier, lower that entry to get us to do these. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I talk with my hands up, like I, I, my grandma used to joke, if you sat on your hands, you would be speechless. And that's pretty true, right? I, I have to talk with my hands when I'm doing things and, and ex explaining, but I know it can be distracting. But if I sit there worrying about what I'm doing with my hands, I'm not focusing on the content that I'm actually wanting to say. And it's about being ourselves. And if you need to look around, if you need to use your hands, if you need to chew your bottom lip, if you need to do things while you're you're presenting and talking and giving that information, do it because mm -hmm. you have to start this process of going, this is just who I am. I'm here to share information. I'm not here to not be me and being okay with that. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. I know you also use Instagram for, for marketing purposes. And, and what I find interesting, Miguel, is that outside of Instagram, you know, there's not much of an online presence as far as website, yeah. Facebook, Google My Business, whatever. And that kind of goes against the grain of what a lot of people say we should be doing. Yeah. So, so how are you finding your clients and, and continuing to expand and, and run your business? So first, you know, when it, if it comes to someone that's new in the industry, in the pet industry, I wouldn't advise for them to do what I'm doing. You should be using all platforms and you should have a website. Um, the reason why I use only Instagram really is because I, I don't want any more customers, but 
I, I just get so many customers. Like I, in <laughs> fact, every time I post a dog training video, I get like five people who call me and say, Hey, I have that same situation. Can you help me? I just can't fit them all in. Mm. Um, so, you know, me, I, I get uh, the majority of my customers through Instagram and through word of mouth. Um, you know, if I had a website and I had a YouTube channel too, it's just, I, I just wouldn't be able to service everybody, but I am getting into now, um, selling online courses for dog yeah. training. Um, so once I have that kicked off, but well, before I even kick that off, I'm going to start a YouTube channel very soon. Actually this within the next 30 days. Um, and then once I, I uh, have the, the courses started, I have to have a website for that because then I'm going to be uh, expanding my, t- my target audience to, to, to everywhere. It's not going to just be New York city. And uh, if there's someone wants to buy a course, they could just buy the course and I don't have to physically do anything for them. So that is going to change soon. Um, I, I am going to start a YouTube and, and a website. Um, and also, it's not a good idea to pull all your eggs in one basket when it comes to like a social media platform because what if that platform goes away? Or especially now in today's climate where you know censorship seems to be like a big thing, you, you may say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing and a platform may drop you. So you should always have your own thing as well. And you know, in, in our industry, dependent industry, we're not saying anything controversial, but you never know. Like, what if, you know, Instagram just decides not to have you on the platform anymore, or if you have a, or if you're only using YouTube, and what if YouTube says, you know, we want to de-platform you, we don't want, we, want, we don't want you to have you on, you, on YouTube, but you got to have a website. So that that is changing. And the reason why I haven't, you know, used more platforms and have a website is because I just, I, I don't really need to, to be honest, until now. <laughs> Yeah, and I think understanding the, the the market that you're trying to go after and the clients that you're going after and going, where are they and how do I talk to them? And for you, that was, well, they're on Instagram, so I'm going to talk to them on Instagram. And that's what I need yeah. to do. And And that takes understanding the platform, how you want to use it. And if your clients are there, go go get them, right? And not feel the need to... To, to, to be everywhere because that is a draining, but no. Okay. I, I just have to understand who I'm trying to talk to. Exactly. And I spend quite a bit of time on Instagram, but if I'm also on TikTok, I'm also on Facebook and I'm also on, on YouTube, then there's only 24 hours in a day. If I'm putting that time and energy into those things and I'm not putting my time and energy into something else. So you have to allocate, allocate your, your, your resources properly. Um, but again, I am, pivoting now to uh, online courses. So that's going to have to change. And I'm going to have to start with YouTube because especially when it comes to the long form videos that, that I post, like the IGTV videos that are over a minute long, Instagram is horrible at exposing my videos. When mm. I first started posting IGTV videos, I used to get about a few thousand um, views on each video without me promoting the video or anything. Just, and without me even putting hashtags. Now I, I have over 18,000 followers. When I post an IGTV video, I get about 500 views. So I, Instagram is just horrible at, at putting out the videos. They are good at post reels. I, I find you get a lot more likes and a lot more views um, and you know pictures and, and short videos as well. But when it comes to IGTV videos, they're horrible at exposing. And a lot of times I have people who follow me every day and, and they like and comment my stuff every day. And they'll ask me a question about dog training. I'll say, I just posted a video, an IGT video on that a couple of days ago. And they say, really? I didn't see it. Hmm. So that's why I, I'm, from now on, I'm going to start uh, those long form videos that I post on. I usually post on IGTV. I'm going to switch over to YouTube now. Miguel, when I hear you talk a lot about your your planning and your your pivoting here, a, a word does keep coming to to mind uh, is execution, and and you seem to be really adept at executing a process and a plan once you get set on it. Is that come naturally and and easy to you, or or how have you developed this this mindset of of sticking to something once you've planned it? Yeah. So, um, again, my time in the Marines definitely, uh, helped shape, you know, that discipline. Um, you know, it's like you, you have a mission and once you have a mission, you, that's your sole purpose in life and you just have to do it. And, you know, whatever roadblocks, you know, come across, you just gotta, you know, push right through them. But 
you know, what I've learned also is that if, again, if you don't like it, you're not excited about it, you're not going to do it well, you're not going to follow through. So whenever I am, you know, uh, starting a, a new venture or trying to execute a new plan, I have to make sure that I'm excited about it. And mm. I, I want to do it. If not, I'm just not going to bother doing it. In fact, I've turned down, I don't even tell a lot of people this, but I've turned down a lot of opportunities um, to collaborate with different companies and different sponsors because I just wasn't excited about it and I just didn't want to do it. Like sometimes I have people who contact me and say, hey, you know, I have this product um, or like a, a dog food company will contact me and say, hey, you know, I want you to make some videos for us. I'm like, sure, great. I'm excited. But then when they give me the details, I want you to say this and I want you to do that. I want you to do that. I'm like, no, I want to do it the way I want to do it. And, hmm. you know, or they expect me to um, kind of, for example, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say what, like, uh, it's a cable um, animal, like dog training, pet care uh, channel on cable. And um, they wanted me to do something with them uh, where, I don't want to get into details because they're going to know I'm talking about them. <laughs> but, uh, sure. They just want, yeah, they just wanted me to, um, to kind of like be more animated and, and, you know, be more Disney fight kind of, and mm. that's not who I am. You know, I, I have a sense of humor, I like to joke around and stuff, but they kind of want to be like, hi, I'm Miguel Rodriguez. And I'm <laughs> just, uh, that's not, they, I, I got the sense that that's how they wanted me to be. And I, I just, I just imagined myself being on camera and people see me behave that way on camera. But when mm. they know that that's not nothing how I am in person, sure. I, I just can't live with myself being that way. So I just, you know, I just didn't, I turned it down. Um, because I do know some people on TV that I've seen on per, in person, they're completely different. I just, I just can't do that. Um, but yeah, so I, I have to be, you have to be excited about it. You have to, to want to do it. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's the key that and, and discipline. Yeah, that excitement that comes into it is that, again, looking at this and going, I, again, I, we, we're our own business owners. We're, we're, we're growing this. We're doing this. We don't, we don't technically have, have to do anything, right? We get to do. We want to do these things and making sure we always bring that aspect into it when we're looking at opportunities and going, sure, I can do this. I can do anything I want to, but do I want to? Is that is that something that was actually going to fill me and bring me joy or, or get me closer to my goals and be true to myself? Uh, and at that, at the end of the day, is is the ultimate question for us: Is this new service going to get me there? Is this new client going to get me there? Is this new opportunity going to get me there? If not, we don't have to say yes to it, and we can feel backed into a corner many times because. We don't want to lose out on it. We don't want to lose out on the money. We, we got to take advantage of this because what else, what else, what else? But knowing, again, like we start off with saying, sometimes we have to let things go and know it's going to work out better in the end. So very true. Very true. Here in closing, one of the, my big takeaways from our previous several talks was, was when you would talk about never stop learning. And then you, <laughs> you added, mm -hmm. even if it's from people that you don't agree with. And I have I've really taken that quote to heart and have continued to to look at stuff. And so, you know, you being a, a big reader and, and always after new stuff, what are some new resources or what are some things that you're reading right now that really excite you or have really helped you that you'd love for more people to know about? The business side, I, I would recommend all of uh, uh, Dan Kennedy's books. Dan S. Kennedy. Uh, he passed away recently, about a year ago, I think. But he has one book on uh, on managing profits and money in your business, and he has another book on managing staff members and another one on managing customers. So strongly recommend you check those out. Um, as far as uh, you know, personal things, um, Jordan Peterson is someone that I really you know admire. I really like his books a lot. Um, if you're a content creator, uh, check out The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. That's a, that's a huge one. Um, also, uh, this book is just, it's incredible. And if you own a business or if you work with people, you just have to read this book. It's uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by um, Dale Carnegie. That's, that's another great one. Um, Think and Grow Rich. Don't, have you ever heard of Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill? I, I have heard of it, but I have not gotten a chance to read it yet. Yes. So with that, um, 
a lot of it is a little a little mystical and esocentric, but it, it really changes the way you think about money because I think a lot of small business owners, especially people in the pet industry, are ashamed of making money. And that kind of changes the way you think about that, which is really important. And uh, another book that's probably one of my favorite books of all time is from the same author, Napoleon Hill. So his book, um, uh, Think and Grow Rich, is, is his most popular book and is actually one of the best-selling books in history, Think and Grow Rich. But he has another book called Outwitting the Devil. That's a fictional book that is, is one of my, it's probably my favorite book of all time. And um, mm-hmm. it's about a guy who is in the business world and he actually interviews the devil. And he learns how to, how, um, you know, whenever you kind of face, you know, self doubt or you're, you're procrastinating, um, it's, it's the work of the devil that's working against you. And the reason why that book is so valuable to me is because, of course, like it's, it's, it's a fictional book and it's not the devil that's coming after you. But it, it kind of, whenever you start to procrastinate, you start to become more self-aware about it. And mm. you realize, you know, when that book is fresh in my mind, I realize, oh, oh well, that's kind of the, the devil coming after me. Like, I, I got to fight this. I got to get through this. And it helps me get over procrastination or, or self-doubt. Whenever I'm kind of, you know, feeling down, you know, a little bit depressed, I'm in a rut. I realize, well, this is something, this is some kind of out force, you know, uh, you know, outside evil force that's, that wants me to be in this position. I can't let that win. Um, so it's an excellent book too. So all those books and a bunch of others, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm, I forgot about, but check those out. Those are great. Yeah, I just moved the War of Art to the top of my reading list. It's been on it for a little while, so uh, I'm going to put that on my the next book that I that I pick up. Um, and but I, I like the uh, that concept that you mentioned about outwitting the devil of recognizing like okay, it might not be the literal devil, but these thoughts, these um, in, these beliefs that we have about ourselves, um, they they bring negative impacts to our lives because we we don't take. Um, you know, we don't believe in ourselves. We we don't take those opportunities that we need to. There's self doubt creeps in. All of these these fears and anxieties that can prevent us from running that business, running the way the life that we want to live. Um, those are things that are trying to hold us back from that. And so I, I love how just being aware of those enough to say, ah, nope, this is that thing. I got to move away. That that is huge in us as we're moving and operating and really making decisions from day to day. Yeah, and and. Uh, a book that's very similar to Outwitting the Devil it is uh, Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art. And when he talks about whenever you're, you're pursuing a, a creative endeavor, let's say it's a podcast or uh, you know creating content or, or writing blogs, writing a book or something, um, whenever you get that, that feeling, I don't feel like doing it, I don't feel like doing this, he calls it resistance. Mm-hmm. That's resistance. And you have to fight that resistance because the further and further you go into resistance, the harder it is to get out of it. And um, the reason why that book helped me out so much is because it, it helped me put a name to it. So just like Outwitting the Devil, whenever I am procrastinating or whatever I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, or I get a little lazy. When I know that's resistance, I, I know that there's, there's actual something, there's something I can actually point at that's, that's causing that. So it's easier to get out of those ruts and, and get out of that procrastination phase. Mm-hmm. So excellent book. Let me know what you think about it whenever you read it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll do. We'll do. Miguel, as always, I've, I've I've learned a lot. I've got a lot on my homework and reading list now uh from <laughs> from talking with you. Uh, but I know that there's always so much more. Um so how can people get in touch with you, follow along and and get signed up to to see when the that YouTube channel comes online and check out your courses? Uh Instagram. Uh it's pretty okay. easy. Just find me on Instagram City Dog Pack. Um, city as in New York City dog as in dog pack as in pack of dogs and just uh, check me out there and if you have any questions shoot me a DM and um, keep a look out for my YouTube page that I'm going to be starting soon and the website and uh, but then by the end of this year I want to have those courses ready as well perfect a lot of exciting things going on Miguel I'm super excited for all that and uh, can't wait to, to have you back on again a lot sooner than um, 200 some odd episodes since last time so uh, we'll we'll be better at that so thank you so Thanks much so. Miguel I really appreciate it thank you it was a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to our next chat 
So how do we continue to pivot and adapt, adapt and overcome as business owners? We never stop learning. We should always be seeking out new and relevant information and sometimes revisiting things that we saw quite a while ago to see if it applies to us these days. Reading, watching, listening, talking, conversing, building relationships with others is what helps keep us exposed and plugged into the world around us. And then we take those lessons and apply them to our business. We know our businesses better than anybody else, but we have to have the knowledge and the tools and the resources on hand to continue to adapt and change and evolve as the world does around us. We want to thank our sponsors, Time to Pet and Pet Perennials, for making today's show possible. And we really want to thank you so much for listening. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your busy week, and we'll be back again soon.